alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Welcome back. We didn't have last week, right? Yeah, I know we didn't. Or did we? I'm like losing track of time. That's crazy. Uh, been all over the place, man. SubhanAllah. Um, so, inshallah, we're going to continue now with the reading of uh, this amazing book, Ayyuh al Walad. We are, um, we're actually towards the end, subhanAllah. It's crazy. Uh, we are approaching, I think there's 24 advices, and we're, we're, we're finishing today the number, uh, in number 18. Um, and I'm trying to find my notes on it. Anyways, um, so the last few times we met, we talked about a really important topic. What was that topic? Yeah, good, very good. Mentorship, and what about it? <laughs> You're like, all right, guys, go get some food. We're done. It's like, you know, what about mentorship? What about mentorship? Huh? Choosing, yeah, okay. Mashallah, you're on fire, three for three. Okay, so we talked about, uh, first and foremost, we talked about why it is necessary for a person to like have a mentor or a teacher and how going through life without a mentor is like, you know, is like going through life without any, without without sight, without being able to see. Um, subhanAllah. And, and uh you know, the, the, the critical nature of being able to have someone that you rely upon to answer your questions, to give you guidance. Imam Ghazali basically is like, look, if you don't have someone that you can reach out to, that you can cling on to uh, in those moments, then it's going to be really difficult. And then he talked about, so first he established the critical nature of it. Then he talked about, you know, what kind of person should you look for? And he mentioned like not everyone that can be that can give a good lecture is a mentor. Not everybody that dresses like, you know, uh, a Hogwarts student, right, can be a good mentor. Like not everybody that has a beard or a hijab or not everyone that kind of dresses that part or their khaz sound good or their ain sound good or their khaz really strong. All of that is fine, but mentorship and a person's ability to teach and become a teacher of somebody else is built upon way more than that, right? And so what do you look for? And he talked about looking for inward and outward piety. Uh, a person that is inspirational when you see how they act, how they talk, how they walk, um, all of that. And then he mentioned how you should be, the last session I think we talked about, what our etiquette should be with said teacher, right? So when you see a teacher, Let's say that, you know, you have Ustada Fatima, inshallah, who will be back next week, by the way. I know everyone's been like, man, why is this guy here? Uh, she'll be back, inshallah. So when Ustada Fatima, like, you know, when you interact with her, like, what's your, how should you interact with somebody in that position? Or if, you know, Safi, when he teaches, like, how should you interact with somebody like that? What are your responsibilities? Or Sheikh Abdel Nasser, Mufti Kamani, people that you look up to, right? Sheikh Yasser Burjaz, Sheikh Omar Salaman. How do we talk with the, uh, those people, mashallah? Hey, Valla. What's going on? Salah Zaki. We went to Turkey together, so he's Turkish now. We're both part Turkish. Mashallah. So uh, that was that section. Now, this section, interest, it's interesting that he includes it in this portion, but it's pretty beautiful. Um, he, he defines three things. He defines three, well, more than that. He defines a few things, but... So one of it's kind of like a subcategory. Imam Ghazali is very famous for that, by the way. He'll be like, point number one, one A, one A one, one A one B. Like that's how he, his mind works in uh, like never ending flow charts and lists. So here he starts now and he says that true spirituality, okay, true spirituality, not fake spirituality. What's fake spirituality? Fake spirituality is like, you know, detox drinks and like steam rooms and manifesting and vibes like that's all fake spirituality okay why is it fake i'm not saying it's fake because people you know don't do it it's not haram for a person to uh drink like paprika and kombucha or whatever like whatever they want you know why is it fake yeah oh, very good 
and they overbelieve in it. And what's the problem with it? Believing in something's not a problem. We all believe in something, but what's the problem? Yeah, and, and well, we believe in something that can bring us divine help, but what's the difference? Kombucha? No, so ours is anchored by something, right? Islam is a deen that is anchored. It's anchored. Anchored by what? The Quran and the life of the Prophet You see, when we talk about why we believe in what we believe, we believe in what we believe because we can trace it all the way back to the Prophet who we believe received it from Allah. It's very simple. It's very straightforward. When someone asks, like, why do or don't you believe in something? My question is, how anchored is it? Right? Is it traceable back to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And if it is, then I will obviously take it and believe in that. Right? So when something is not uh, solid, right, you can't attach yourself to it because you are actually, it's not heavy enough to hold you down. You know what I mean? If you tried to uh, anchor a boat, right, but the anchor you used was a balloon, it wouldn't hold the boat anywhere. The job of the anchor is to make sure that the boat doesn't float away. So we have to make sure that whatever we anchor ourselves to is heavy enough and strong enough to hold us down. And that's only the Quran and only the life of the Prophet Sallallahu and this deen of Islam. So spirituality is a real thing, but we have to look for it in the right places. Okay, everybody has a spiritual appetite. Every single person in this room has a desire to come closer to Allah. That's spirituality and to be better. That's spirituality. But just like your appetite can be fulfilled by good things, things that are actually good for you and things that are pointless for you, spirituality is the same way. Okay, when you are hungry and you know are thirsty, when you're really thirsty, right? As much as you might enjoy Coke or Sprite or like a juice, what do you know that you really need? I'm not calling you out. I know you're sipping on your boba, right? As much as you might enjoy, what do you know you really need? Water, especially on these days, right? It's like 100 some degrees outside. You're doing stuff outside. You're hot. You're sweating. You know you need water. Sure, like a sweet drink is nice, but your, your heart understands in order for my body to recover from this, I need water. Water is what I need, okay? So with spirituality, it's the same way. We all have that appetite. But we know that the correct spiritual path is the right way to sustain that and to fulfill that, right? Yes. Well, what if you were to overindulge in something that's, you know, say spiritual, uh, like what was it, like other things that people believe in? What if you were to overindulge? How do you come back to a straight path? We'll talk about that. We'll get there. That's a good question. Inshallah. Well, he answers it. The reason why I'm not going to answer is because he answers it, right? But we'll we'll definitely address that specific issue. And by the way. There's also a, a, a possibility that a person can overengage with even the Islamic side of the text in a way that's not healthy. And the Prophet ﷺ taught us how to sort of negotiate those things. So he said that know that spirituality has two characteristics. Number one is steadfastness. Right? What does steadfastness mean? Give me another word. Give me like a synonym for steadfastness. Uh, there is an element of patience in it, for sure. There is an element of good steadiness in it. What else? Huh? Yeah, being persistent, being consistent, okay? Steadfastness, the, the key in that is that you have enough patience and you have enough of a good pace because sometimes if you run too fast in the beginning of the race, you're going to die before you can finish, right? So you have to be able to maintain a good pace, be patient when things don't go your way in order to be consistent. So he says, number one, spirituality should not feel like a sprint. It should not feel like one day, yes, two days, no, one day, yes, two. That's not what spirituality is. Spirituality, according to all of the sources, is what? Making the right decisions as much as you can day in and day out that you know is going to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's spirituality. That's taqwa. Okay. So he says, number one, the characteristic is steadfastness. You should not be like super spiritual on Monday and then the rest of the week you put your phone on, you know, do not disturb. That's not how spirituality works. And, and, and subhanAllah, you know, if we want to dive in this a little bit deeper, part of the reason why maybe people avoid trying to do the right thing is because they know 
that once they open that door towards what is good, that they maybe are going to have to leave some things behind. And so they're like, you know, I don't want to like go to Umrah yet. I've actually met people who are like, I don't want to go to Hajj yet. Like why? They're like, I still have a few things I have to do. And they don't mean good things, right? <laughs> but subhanAllah, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something that one of my teachers, Sheikh Hassan, he told me that I thought was really profound. He said that, um, you know, we always talk about like missed opportunities. Uh, we always talk about like, this is a dumb example, but for some reason it's coming to my mind. Are you ready? The, uh, there's this like weird, there's this weird like anxiety that people have these days where they, uh, they like, they don't want to get married because they're afraid that they're, that they might find someone better. It's like a weird thing that I'm coming across. So they're like, I, I found somebody, I like them, but I don't know if I want to get married. Why? Because what if somebody better comes along next year? Like, well, at that point you shouldn't be looking. So you won't see them, right? <laughs> you won't see them. So, so, so it's interesting, right? So this is kind of like this, this weird version of FOMO. Okay. And, uh, you know what Sheikh Hassan told me? I thought it was really profound. He said, people are so concerned about missing what they like missing a scenario like that. Like what if somebody comes along better? I don't want to take this job because what if I get a better offer? I don't want to buy this house because what if a, a, a better one shows up in the market in a month? And they said that, first of all, Allah gives us istikhara to solve those problems. But the second is he said, what if you're missing out on what this thing could do to change you and make you into something different? And you're missing out on that. You guys feel as deep, right? What did he say? For example, I don't want to make Hajj yet. Why? Because I have so much of my life that I want to live. I'll make it when I'm older. What about the person you become after you make Hajj when you're young? What about the discoveries you have at Hajj when you're 30 and the life you live after that? Versus, and this happened, you make Hajj when you're 70 and you regret, why did I make it so late? I actually sat with a woman on Hajj that we took. She cried after Hajj because she said, I wish I made Hajj earlier. What kind of person I would have been having these realizations when I was 35. She actually told me this. She was crying on the day of, uh, of uh, the last day of Jamarat. And, and, you know, we were like all, you know, people were crying, but she looked like very, very sad. So I went to her and I said, no, you did Hajj. Mashallah, it's amazing. She goes, I'm happy. But at the same time, I can't help but think who I would have been had I done it earlier. So. We do have the nefsical FOMO where we're like, oh man, but what if I don't get a chance to, but what about the taqwa FOMO of like, man, what could I be? What could I be? Like, who could I be? What kind of person would I be? What kind of challenges would not rattle me? What kind of, you know, being able to see Allah in every given scenario would happen if I committed to that early on? So being steadfast. Number two is he says serenity from creation. Serenity from creation. What does that mean? Do people make you mad? You guys got upset. That was a really like it was a really emphatic. Mm -hmm. You're like right now. Is that your boba? Is that why you drink it? Yeah. <laughs> You're like mm -hmm. someone takes too many of the of the tapioca. Okay, so people make you mad. So how do you deal with that? Okay, that's actually a really good point. It depends on who it is. What if it's someone that you know, you have you have the ability to take revenge. Because we get mad, but we can't take revenge always, right? What if it's somebody that you do have the ability to take revenge? Uh, interesting. A little bit of self-control. What else? Okay. You know, it's a subhanAllah, it's a um again it goes back to that conversation like the, the choices that we make, we think that we're making choices, but we realize that even when you do something, what you miss out on is also a choice. Everything you gain, you lose. For everything you gain, you lose something else. 
you know, uh, when you're deciding if you want to have more dinner or dessert, you realize everything you gain, you lose something else. It's the same in life, dude. Like if you take revenge on something, if you let somebody bother you, you're losing that piece, right? Sometimes you need to lose that piece, right? Because passivism for the sake of it is not something we find in this Dean. Like we actually believe, like if you see bombs dropping on Palestinians, you should not be like, it's, you know, that's no, you should have what's called, you know, Rira for Muslims. You should have this, this, you should have like fire within you when you see wrongs happening, right? I mean, we saw this happen collectively as a country last year, finally. And it's not enough, but when you see George Floyd being killed and the whole country, you know, at least those of them that saw that as a wrong, subhanAllah, those of us, I should say, I saw as a wrong, when they came together, you saw that fire in people's hearts, right? And that's how it should be, okay? But we should not have that same fire for things like the Phoenix Suns getting destroyed, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's not, it's, you see, that's not the same. Right. So what's the difference? Islam allows noble anger, anger that's noble, virtuous anger, being upset, disturbing your serenity for what des what deserves it. But generally, the state of the believer is calm. Right. We don't think with our emotions. We think with our aql. That's why Allah gave it to us. We use our emotions to help fuel us, but we think with our intellect. So serenity from creation. This also means things like not getting jealous of people, not backbiting people not getting rattled. This is what this is talking about. Okay. So he said, whoever makes their themselves steadfast, they're consistent. And number two, their manners and morals are beautiful in dealing with people. Then this person is a truly spiritual person. This is, th this is real spirituality. Like no one cares how you dress. No one cares, you know, about anything really, how, how, how religious a person portrays himself to be. He says, just wait until you interact with people. And you'll see how religious a person is. And this is very true. I mean, I'll tell my own stories because I'm I've had to make mistakes and learn. Like I was a youth director in the city, and I remember one of the things that we used to do uh to see, you know, like spiritual growth was play basketball. Because that was an indication of whether or not people were spiritually mature. Because it's just a game. No one's playing for a 10-day contract. You know, some guys think they are. No one's playing for money. No one's you know, everyone's just playing to enjoy themselves for recreation. But some people destroyed and burned down relationships for the sake of a, a Sunday morning game. It's stupid, right? And and some people, we don't have to look at anybody. <laughs> and, so, and some people, and, and by the way, like I found myself sometimes on the wrong end of that description as well, getting really upset. And it's dumb. It makes no sense. You know what I mean? Um and, and, and so it doesn't matter how religious a person sees himself. If they lose their serenity and their calm and they lose themselves for something that's so ignoble, it's like basketball, right? Then it doesn't make any sense and it goes against that de definition. So a person could be giving khutbah on Friday at the masjid, but on Sunday they could disprove everything they said in that khutbah. What's the point, man? So dumb. This is why the scholars told us, like, if you find yourself struggling, just go be alone for a while. Because in loneliness, you can actually discover like your faults. When you're surrounded by people, there's too much other things to focus on. So they said, just go sit by yourself for a while. Okay. So uh, he then defines steadfastness. You want to work on this? You want to be? You want to become steadfast? Because everyone here is like, yeah, I'd like to be. I'd like to have these traits. How do you get there? He says steadfastness means that you should only take for yourself as much as you need. It's interesting. What a weird connection. To be consistent, to be patient, to be able to forbear difficulty. He says, only take as much as you need. It's really interesting. Uh, what does he mean by that? And can you guys explain to me, like, what what, what the benefit of taking which, only what you need is? And maybe give me a scenario. Where you only take what you need. Like anything? No. Anything, dude. Uh, when you need, like, a loan or something, you borrow Wow. That's a really good example. Are you applying for FAFSA? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone's like going to FAFSA. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good. No, really. That's subhanAllah. That's very mature. That's very mature, dude. Because you know yourself and we all know ourselves. Loans, you have to pay back. And even Islamically, by the way, let's talk about this, right? Is it halal to take a loan? There's, accept there's permissibility for certain uh, reasons. One of them is education. But what you just said is one of the conditions no one mentions. Everyone's like, yeah, halal, go for it. No, 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 hold on. 
yes, it, a law, it, you know, there's uh, the permissibility of taking a loan sometimes is conceded even with maybe interest attached to it for the sake of something like education. But what you mentioned is a key point that the scholars, the muftis, they say is what? You can't take more than you need. You know, even people who are going to med school, uh, when they graduate, they finish med school and they have like a $500,000 debt with interest on it. They come to me and they're like, you know, in a Tesla, I'm like, uh, uh, <laughs> no, why? Because you have to get rid of that debt first. You know, you better be driving the Camry for a bit. You know, the same one that got you through med school, you better be driving that for a bit because you have to pay it off. And mashallah, mashallah, like people, you know, it's good. I'm, I, I, people are doing well with that. So that's very good. If you are signing up for loans, if you, for whatever reason, if you're buying a house, if you're doing this, you don't need you don't need to take a lot more than you need. Right. Think about it. Be honest. You also don't have to be like stingy, you know, with your family, like only one outfit. It's like, I need more. You wash it. It's like, no, no, maybe there, there might be an extra, you know, outfit or whatever. But yeah, you know what's balanced. Very good. Yeah. Okay. It's a business relationship. So yeah, very good. There's another book that Imam Ghazali wrote. Well, it's it's a chapter in one of his books where he talks about the rights of companionship. This is one thing he wrote. He actually wrote very beautifully. He said, "Don't be heavy on people, and don't." And he he actually said, "Don't take too much." Like being heavy for him was when you take too much from people and you never help out. Yeah, and you never help out. You know, like it's one thing to expect, but then to be there, it's another thing completely to never be there, and to still expect. It means it's like a burden. You know, his relationship is not a relationship. It's, it's a it's a burden. So he his advice was, you know, give more than you take, because then you'll be you'll be somebody that's like, you're not baggage. You know, you actually are meaningful. Because uh, some of your baggage when you fly, you need it. It's critical. Some of it you don't. You're like it's too heavy. So that's very good. And only taking what you deserve or what you need is something where Imam Ghazali is basically saying what, you know, what something that rattles us is when our standard is too high and life changes. So if your standard is high and you don't have the ability to have that, now your life changes. Very real example just happened to me two weeks ago or last weekend. Uh, I traveled out of town and I have, alhamdulillah, I have a nice coffee machine at home. And I stayed at an Airbnb. Okay. So usually when I travel, I just look up for a coffee shop nearby. However, I was in Orlando. There's nothing in Orlando. It was like alligators. You know, Allah gives us signs to not live places. Okay. <laughs> One of them is alligators. Like, I just don't understand. Who like walked up to a swamp, saw these giant dragon looking things on their stomachs and was like, yeah, this is a great place to live. Apparently it's not supposed to be lived in. Uh, anyways, I could go on about Orlando. Um, so there's no coffee shops. I knew it was bad when I went to Google Maps and near our Airbnb and I typed in coffee and 7-Eleven showed up. I knew it was bad. Like I knew it was bad. Okay. So there, there was a time when I would have been like, you know, a true snob about that. But I've learned from my snobbery and from my teachers that, look, you can't have coffee, just have tea. You can't have tea, just have water. <laughs> just be happy with whatever you have, you know? Again, this is like I'm 33 now. When I was 25, maybe it'd be different. Okay. So why is it important to only take what you need is because when it's not there, when what you want is not there, you won't be rattled. You know, and you see this, especially on things like Hajj. Hajj is crazy because it's like the ultimate reduction of life. And some people just can't handle it. You know, they need wants and needs. Some people's needs, some people's wants are actually some people's needs and they can't they can't dial it down and it's really really hard to, to dial yourself back so don't get used to taking more than you need because you're not gonna be able to be set past that right subhanallah so he says take as much as you need then he says dealing with people in a beautiful manner means you do not burden them according to what you need you don't burden them but burden yourself according to what they need 
That's a beautiful relationship. Beautiful relationships are that you don't burden other people, you burden yourself, right? You don't make it life difficult for them, you make your life a little difficult for them. You know what I mean? You give them a ride, you drop them off, right? Even if it means you gotta leave 20 minutes earlier, that's okay. You spend, you know, there's only one Coke left in the fridge, they come over, you want it, you give it to them. You know what I mean? Those are the little moments. And again, this is where Imam Ghazali is so beautiful because everything is so practical. Every day in your life, you're going to have a fork in the road, me or another person. How many times can you choose the other person? The more you do that, the closer to Allah you are. Because the less you are obsessed about yourself, the closer to Allah you can be. The nafs is just like a shackle that holds us back from Allah. The more that I just focus on me, guess what? The less time I have for Allah. The more that I give to other people and take care of other people as much as I can, the more that I can free myself from my desires and go close to Allah Ta'ala. And that's why you see, man, the people who are the most beautiful are the ones who take care of other people, right? The hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that afdalu nas, right? The best of those people are what? Khayru nas, men, in fountain nas. Those people who are the most beneficial to others, those who are around them. So instead of expecting to be benefited, try to benefit people uh, inshallah. Okay. So he mentions that and it's crazy, right? Because subhanAllah, we don't think that spirituality is based on things like taking little and being nice to people, but try it. It's really difficult. It, it really messes with the nafs because we always want more and we always want to focus on ourselves. So he flips it, take less and focus on others. You're like, huh? Interesting. But you might be irritated for a while. Okay. Cause that's how the nafs works. But it's okay. If your nafs is irritated, it means good things are happening. Okay? All right. So the next thing he says is you asked me about his, because remember, these are all answers. He says, you asked me about ubudiyah. Ubudiyah means what it means to be a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? That word servitude. He said it means three things. Number one is that you try your best to follow whatever the sharia says. You try your best. Absolutely try your best. Okay? And you never, ever try to skip on it. Number two and this is hard, satisfaction with whatever Allah has decreed for you. This is a difficult one. You guys ever been disappointed before? About what? Your boba? Ending? <laughs> it was good. Single tear. It was good. Yeah. What do you guys, what have you guys been disappointed for or about? Rejection, right? In life happens. Pandemic. Yeah. SubhanAllah. Sad, man. I have kids. That's the problem. That's the problem with the pandemic is the kids. It's so sad, man. Adults, man, we can figure it out. We can wear masks, whatever. But to see kids, like, that's sad. You know, they miss their friends and stuff. So, yeah, it's very, very difficult. SubhanAllah. Why is this happening? I want to go to Umrah. I haven't, you know, I want to see the haram full at least. I want to see people around the Kaaba. Like, what's going on, you know? Very good. What else? Yeah. Oh, yeah. When your expectations are higher than reality. You see the bears? May Allah, may Allah forgive you. <laughs> right? Inshallah, we'll have a good year this year, inshallah. Justin Fields. Anyone else? Disappointment? What well, leads to disappointment? What have you felt disappointed in or by? School. Yeah. Okay. So how do you get past that? How do you, how do you deal with your disappointment? Cry. Good. I'm actually happy you mentioned that. Human emotion, Allah Ta'ala gave us. It's not wrong to be upset. It's not wrong. You can cry, it's fine. The Prophet ﷺ cried. When he was sad, he cried. And the companions even asked him about his tears, and he said that this is rahmah from Allah. Imagine having all that pent up pressure inside of you and you can't express it. You can't cry about it, right? They, they say, like, have a good cry. That's what they mean. It just lets everything out. It's the way Allah designed us, okay? Allah Ta'ala, He even describes those people in the Qur'an when He mentions them. Zaki, I forget the verse, uh, but it's a sajda. That those people that have fear of Allah, they fall on their faces and sujood crying. Bukiya. Yes. So it's near. So Allah Ta'ala, He describes crying in the Qur'an as being a way of communicating to Allah. Right? So crying is, 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 uh, is something very powerful. Okay, but where does the disappointment have to stop? 
Disappointment can be upset with what, but can never be upset with who. You can hate something and love the one who gave it to you. You know what I mean by that? You can hate the car accident or the flat tire. Definitely. It's okay. But you should never, ever resent the one that put you in that situation. Why? Because you trust that he knows what he's doing. So all disappointment is solved by trust. If I trust Allah, then my disappointment, it, it, uh, it figures itself out. And the more you trust Allah, the less time you're disappointed. Because you're like, it's okay. You may not know the answer, though. That's the big thing. You, you're not going to, something's not going to happen. You're like, ah, I know exactly why this is happening. No, no, no. All you say is, ah, I know that Allah is doing something. <laughs> and that's it. And you just roll with it. You know, it's hard. It's easier said than done. But the older you get, the more it happens to you. And the more you start to kind of realize that Allah Ta'ala is opening doors for you and saving you from things and moving things around for you, subhanAllah. Like, I mean, you ask anybody. I'm sure if we went down the line of the room, what was one thing in your life you wanted, Allah didn't give it to you, and you're better off for it. I'm sure we'd all have a story. Or what's one thing you didn't want, Allah made you do it, and you're better off for it. I'm sure we'd all have a story. So we don't even need to, right? But you just think to yourself, when did Allah take away something from you? And it was actually better for you, right? And when did Allah Ta'ala give you something? And it was actually not that you wanted and it wasn't good for you. And realize that you have to just bank on Allah Ta'ala. And that's why Ibn Ta'ala, he says what? He says, That sometimes Allah gives by taking away. And sometimes he takes away by giving. So Allah gives you a lot of money and he's actually taken, if a person's weak, they get taken away from what? Their family, their friends, their community, because their focus is on the money. Allah Ta'ala sometimes takes away money and the person gains what? Family, friends, community, because maybe they couldn't work as much anymore. I actually met this physician over the weekend and he was saying that like because of, of the pandemic, all of the, uh, what do they call them? All the procedures that are optional, I forget what they're called. Optional procedures, there we go. He said all of those procedures were paused. What are they called in medicine? Electives, there we go. All the elective procedures were paused. So he, he he does both. He does the emergent ones and he also does the elective procedures. So he said they were all paused and it like freed up his schedule by 50%. He was like, I was only working two days a week. Okay, now obviously it affects your income as well, but he was like, you know what? I'm going to try to make the most out of this. Gets in the car, goes on a road trip and drives and like does all this beautiful road trip of the entire part of the country and all that kind of stuff. And he's like, I spent time, more time with my family in those six weeks than I have in the past maybe 10 years. Allah Ta'ala, sometimes he takes away, but he actually gave you something, right? So being able to see that is important. So that's number two. Number three is true or is, and this is hard, this is very hard, is stopping yourself from, from stopping yourself from indulging in something that would please you in order to seek the pleasure of Allah. Now, here's a really, really tough part. Stuff that's haram is kind of easy to not do. Why? Yeah, because it's haram, <laughs> right? If something's haram, sure, we all make mistakes, but generally the thought of punishment is like a strong motivator, right? So we're like, ah, oh, it's haram, I don't want to do it. And then maybe the the thought of punishment, the thought of judgment from other people. So it's it's, it's relatively easy to not do haram just because you're conditioned to be afraid of it, not want to do it. That's fine. But what about things that are halal that can still take you away from Allah? Do those things exist? Or is everything halal good at all times? Or I'll say best, huh? I, everyone says Netflix first. Whenever we talk about stuff like this, everyone's like, Netflix Maybe Netflix is haram. <laughs> That's not a fatwa. Those who are watching online, they're like, they're can't, canceling a subscription. Maybe, no, seriously, Netflix is a good example. So like phones are generally halal. Social media generally, of course, there's haram parts, but generally halal. But like if a person goes on social media too long at night, scrolls on TikTok, misses Fajr, then what happened? I indulged in something that was permissible and it took me away from Allah. Now, the Hanafis have a very interesting approach to this. The Hanafi Madhab, they say that if you indulge in something that is halal, 
and it repeatedly hinders and takes you away from your obligation, that thing is no longer permissible for you. Right? Why? Because you can't handle it. So if I if I stay up late seven days a week watching TV and I miss Fudger seven mornings a week because I stayed up late, guess what is no longer permissible for me? Watching TV past a certain time. Right? Even though you're like, well, what's hot on about that? So, well, you can't handle it. Right? It's like giving a baby food before they can chew. Food is okay, yes. Baby eating is okay, yes. But you can't give a baby the same food you give an adult. Because why? Clearly the baby can't handle it. So that's what they say. It's not a lot. So giving up something haram for Allah is good. Giving up something that's even halal for Allah is amazing. Choosing to go to bed on time. Giving up money for sadaqah. That money's yours. You're allowed to spend it. You can go buy more stuff. You can go whatever. You can go buy food. You can go buy clothes. It's your money. Or Allah gave it to you. But when you give it up for Allah, that's amazing. So he says, when you forsake your own pleasures for the pleasure of Allah. That's what sadaqah is. When you fast, not in Ramadan, outside of Ramadan. When you fast outside of Ramadan, you gave up food for what? For Allah. That's why fasting is so beautiful. Because it's truly one of the most sincere things a person can do because it's so easy to hide it. Okay. We'll stop there, inshallah, and then we'll continue next week because he talks about tawakkul, what true trust in Allah means and what true sincerity is. And the opposite of sincerity is riyah. So we'll talk about that, inshallah. But today I feel like it was kind of heavy. He gave a lot, mashallah. He's just giving off these like these one liners that are just crushing it, mashallah. So we ask Allah Ta'ala to grant us all of the good that he talked about and protect us from all of the dangers that he mentioned. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean. anyone have any questions? Day's great, alhamdulillah. Uh, Got a crazy tan slash burn going on. Yeah. What is your opinion about? Um, I don't have opinions on anything. <laughs> <laughs> I just read books. <laughs> <laughs> on what? Well, uh, the statement you made about the hadith, you said it's haram. It's like it's like it's bad for you. Yeah, yeah. So I would that was, I was just I was articulating something interesting, which is that in 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 one of the madhahib in the usul of the Hanafi madhab. There, there's a shifting. Not, not actually only the Hanavis, by the way. This is, you know, I just studied the Hanavi method, but like you find this in generally things that are permissible, things that are mubah. If they persistently take somebody away from something, then those things are, are th- that status may change for that person. So, you know, what's permissible for me may not be permissible for you if you can't handle it, or vice versa. If I can't handle it, it's not permissible for me. Okay. So some people can stay up late and still wake up for Fajr. Okay. It's just something they can do. That's awesome. But some people can't handle it. So that means when the clock strikes midnight or whatever, 11, whatever is late, then you have to make that call. Otherwise, you're venturing off into uh, dangerous territory. So it's just something very beautiful. Because why? Why is it beautiful? They want to protect your spirituality at all costs. That's what Sharia is, right? Protect spirituality at all costs. Even if things are permissible, they might not be the best. Yeah. I would the ability to be able to gain that perspective usually comes from experience, which is tough, but it's learned. Number two is good company. You know, I, I think being around good people who can help give you perspective when times are going south, when times are not good, is something that provides you uh, ample ability to see through the fog. Because sometimes your friends can see it, you can't. You know, the famous, he wasn't good for you, right? I mean, w- w- that, that movie lines and like, it's a lot of, you know, don't worry, he wasn't even good for you. You're better off without him, right? Or her, or whatever it is. It's usually the other way around, right? Uh, that That's actually like, that's actually a prophetic example of nasiha, right? Because nasiha doesn't just mean advice. It means to purify. Nasahtu. The Arabs would say, I purified the honey. So 
sometimes when your friends are giving you that sincere advice, it's purifying you. Okay. So being around people who can see clearly when you're rattled is a good way for you to kind of, it's almost like a spotter when you're lifting. It's a good way for you to gain that strength, even though you yourself are not necessarily doing it on your own, but then you start to learn, right? And then the next time it happens, you are able to have that perspective as well, slowly, slowly. So I would say number one experience, but also surround yourself with good people, be around good people, and then you'll start to be able to pick up those traits inshallah. Laura, anything, any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's again, it just takes time and you have to trust the process, as they say. You know, the first time it's really tough. And that's why being around good people is helpful because they can pick you up. And then over time, you start to develop trust. He actually is going to define tawakkul next. So we'll talk about it next Thursday, inshallah. Yeah. Yeah. When you do that with multiple people, how do you avoid kind of burning out or that feeling of when you need that book, then you might not have the people that you need to learn if they want to get into it? Yeah. Gave the most and so how can you try to guide yourself? Yeah, yeah, very good. There's a comment here from somebody I have to correct. She said, no love for Orlando. I love Muslims everywhere. I don't have to love their city, but I love them. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so that's a very good point and, and this is something by the way the Prophet Sallallahu like uh, when you read stories of like amazing people it's important for you to understand that those are descriptive not prescriptive there's a difference when you read the story of Abu Bakr Siddiq giving away all of his money all of his money and then he's being asked what did you leave for your family so I left them Allah and his messenger that's not a prescription that was something descriptive that was specific to him. Not everyone can do that. How do we know? We know because when the Prophet ﷺ was met with other people who wanted to do the same thing, like Kaab, the Prophet ﷺ said, don't. <laughs> don't give away all your money. Save some for yourself and your family. Right? Don't give it all to charity. Why? You can't handle that. Okay? So what does that mean? That means that we all have different capacities. And it's very important for us to be aware of our capacities and to listen to those ar around us when they try to advise us in that way. So like teachers, friends, family, they say, hey, I think you're, you're, you're burning out a little bit. You might need to like, you know, take some time off or whatever, self-care, go do what makes you happy, right? Go do what gives you that sense of relief. Maybe it's working out, maybe it's, maybe it's ice cream, maybe it's taking a nap, whatever, right? You don't have to be the person that always picks up everybody and does this and this, right? So that relationship and that good company is important there as well, too. Uh, but having that gauge internally to know when it's too much is, is absolutely critical. Because if you burn out, you can't help anybody anymore. So you need to know what's safe for you. And have, over time, there will be days where you can do more and days that you can do less. But you know, sincerity, what you can do. Yeah. Good question. I mean, subhanAllah, sometimes, and you feel guilty. Never compare yourself to other people as well, right? Because everyone's capacity is different. But yeah. Anybody else? You did this. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? She's like, fix the hijab. <laughs> All right. Barakul Afikum, everybody. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Drop it. Yeah. Communication is a skill that's like really difficult to like get better at because a lot of times um, there's a lot of reasons why, but I think that it just becomes challenging for us to communicate directly because we're afraid of so many different outcomes. I would just recommend trying to communicate and have a good conversation about your abilities and what you're able to do. You know, people said, the question for those who are asking online is, 
how do you know, like, if people are leaning on you or putting a burden on you too much, like, where do you draw the line? I would, I would, I would say that you need to first know that about yourself. And then you can obviously communicate that to people, especially if someone takes a lot from you and doesn't give. See, because when people give back to you, it like refills your ability to give. Like when we help each other, it motivates us. That's why the whole Starbucks thing of like pay it forward. Oh, the person before you paid for your drink, you're like, yeah, I'll take care of the next person. Right? So like when you do stuff for others, it like it gives you that himma. Uh, or when they do it for you, it gives you the himma to do for others. So if this person is like consistently just taking, take, taking, and you don't, you just don't have that. Maybe you find yourself resenting them. It's better to, it's better to pull back, and to make things clear rather than develop hatred and enmity for that person. It's better to kind of, and you don't have to tell them, "I'm starting to hate you." Like that's not a good way to do that. But you should say like, "Hey, I, you know, uh, I know that I've been driving you, or like, I know that you and I've been riding together for this, this, this." And don't put it on them. Make it more passive. So I know that you've been asking for rides is not good. I know that you and I have been driving together to school. That's a that's a passive way to say that. Uh, but I have to start dropping off my sister as well at her school, and it may be difficult for me. So let me know if there's any other way I can help. But it looks like this ride thing may not work for the long term, right? It, again, it may take a little bit of strategy. Uh, it may take a little bit of you know softness, soft landing. Uh, Someone bios, <laughs> but all right, mashallah. But may Allah ta'ala guide everybody to Islam. Uh, but you can do it, inshallah. Okay. First time she was referenced in Halakha. All right. <laughs> Take care, everybody. We'll see you, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.